at daybreak he entered the temple to teach. All of the crowd sat down at his feet. He spoke with such wisdom as they never heard. In amazement they listened as he taught the word. All of a sudden, and burst through the door. A woman was brought as she stood near the Lord. The sin she committed was not like the rest. Caught in adultery, the penalty death. As they awaited her sentence with stones in the hand, Jesus knelt down and he wrote in the sand. He lifted his eyes and he spoke to each one. You without sin, cast the first stone. In just a few moments, her accusers were gone. With no one around her, she was standing alone. He forgave her sin as she went on her way. As she ran through the city, the joy she proclaimed. Justified had never sinned. Justified was always cleansed. Justified had never wandered so far from home. Jesus took all my sin away. He gives new mercies every day. And now I'm living my life justified. Now my sins were many was too great. My accusers had gathered up to this be the day. I cried out to Jesus. He came in my stead. He told my accusers, I made all his death. Justified and never sinned. Justified was always cleansed. Justified and never wandered. So far from home, Jesus took all my sin away. He gives new mercies every day. And now I'm living my life justified. Now I'm living my life justified. first-hand information. Listen to what God's done for me. It's a remarkable transformation of what I used to be. Once I was a losing sinner. I was weak in my spiritual fitness. By His grace, I became a winner, and that made me an expert witness. Can I get a witness? Are there any believers in this house? Is anybody washed in the blood? Born again without a doubt. Stand up and testify. Let God be glorified. And we then bless. Can I get a witness? The saints have gone before us. They were tried by opposition. Yet they testified with fullness. They were proud to be called Christian. Like them, don't be ashamed. Just live what you profess. Stand up in Jesus' name. Because you've been called to be a witness. Can I get a witness? Are there any believers in this house? Anybody washed in the blood? Born again without a doubt. Stand up and testify. Let God be glorified. Have we been blessed? Can I get a witness? Have we been blessed? Can I get a witness? God's good. Yep. I often wondered, I didn't ask my brother Joey, you got to keep, oh, keep praying for Joey too with his COVID and my brother Jimmy with uh, prostate cancer. That would be a good thing. Keep praying for him. Um, but Joey, you know, he made several trips over to Africa and uh, he said that saying, I believe, he told me, that it comes from over there. I don't know if it was Nigeria or whatever. It was some missionary that was over there heard a black guy coming down this side of the street and the other guy walking the other side. One guy said, God's good. And the other black guy going the other way said, all the time. Then the other guy said, God is good. And that's how they greeted. 
And I imagine that may be almost like that fish, you know, back in the Roman days when the church was uh, being persecuted. Maybe that was some kind of key because, you know, they're killing them people over there left and right. They're Christians. God's good, you know. And uh, so, amen. And he is good. And we're creatures of habit, George. Never forget that, George. You picking on George? Oh, yeah, man. I like picking on George. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Why do you tell George that? Because I was over here sitting on the bench, right? And I was hesitating whether to get up or not. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? I'm so used to the pain in my knees for all them, you know, for a few years there that uh, and all of a sudden I move my knees and says, oh, I ain't going to do that no more. Modern technology. Hallelujah. But that hasn't went by. I mean, a lot of things haven't <laughs> got rid of yet, but amen. All right, so turn to your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, wake up. I don't know, maybe I should make everybody stand when I'm reading the scriptures uh, like everybody else because it, it works against my flesh a little bit, but I mean, honor. You know where honors do, right? And uh, amen. We're going to preach a message on watchers or sleepers. Watchers or sleepers. So don't go to sleep in the service. Amen. Watch. <laughs> see what's happening. Let's pray. Father God, we love and appreciate you. Thank you for the Holy Ghost to God. We pray that the the hearers, Father, that are saved, have asked asked you to fill them for the hearing. And God, we're surely trying to do our part through the preaching and. God, but if you don't get working, ain't nothing getting done. And so we give you all the praise, honor, and glory for what you're going to do. Thank you for those that are here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote this uh, letter. It's an epistle, and it was written from Corinth in A.D. 54. And uh, shortly after Paul's departure from Thessalonica in Acts 16 and chapter 17. And it's, uh, it's the earliest of his letters. Uh, the theme of it is uh, epistle is threefold to conform young con I'm sorry to confirm young disciples in the foundational truths already taught them to exhort them to go on to holiness three to comfort them concerning those who had fallen asleep the second coming of Christ is prominent throughout the epistle is incidentally most interesting as showing the richness in doctrine of the primitive evangelism. During a mission of about one month, the apostle had taught all the great doctrines of the Christian faith. I'm telling you, if you understand what I just said, that's heavy duty. In one epistle, you'll find all the main doctrines of the Christian faith. And uh, was already taught to them way back yonder when they were being persecuted. And uh, so we have it here today, preserved, perfect, inspired word of God. And uh, we need to uh, take heed to it. So watchers and sleepers. Verse 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief. When? In the night. And the illustration is what? You're not going to catch a thief at night, right? You got lights outside your house. You, you got you know, these automatic lights, you got everything so that thieves are not going to break into your house. Anyway, it's going to be taken at a moment, as we found in, in the, uh, our Sunday school. But at any rate, the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Why is that so important? Because we can see and the world can. Christian, you can see. Even when you're backslidden, believe it or not, you can see things that the world still can't see. It's amazing how that works. You think about, think about God's kids, too, in verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be what? Sober. Sober. For they that sleep, 
sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. I mean, it's possible from reading this Bible right here that God's kids can sleep. They can sleep. That's what the warning's about. Uh, verse 8, But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. In verse 8, Apostle Paul's instructing us that we must have our armor on. And uh, the study in Ephesians there is obvious. You go over there and you find out that he tells us to put on the armor. And the Apostle Paul is, is sort of associating the children of the light sober. That means you can think clearly. Think clearly. And we know drugs, alcohol, skews that. No matter what you think you can do on all those things. You're not, you're just not normal. Amen. And uh, sleeping means not aware, don't care. And the Apostle Paul is saying, we ought to have that armor on. We ought to be aware that we have to have the armor on. We shouldn't leave the house without the armor on. Uh, you think about the, uh, the helmet of salvation. So many Christians go in and out of depression as far as... Uh, losing it or getting it, thinking they lost their salvation, never had their salvation. Did they do this? Did they do that? I mean, put on the helmet, man. Think about the time you were lost and think about the time that you went from there to being saved. Think about that. God doesn't lie. He does what he says he's going to do. You believe that gospel. You came to him, believe the Lord Jesus Christ is the only hope, the only way to heaven. You ask him to save you. He says he did. Stop calling God a liar. Settle that thing and put that salvation helmet on, meaning that when you die, you're going to heaven. While you're living positionally, you're in heaven, spiritually. I mean, that's a blessing. See, if we, kept, if we thought of that first, put that helmet on first, it may straighten out the other, the other uh, uh, obvious parts that we need to cover. But uh, verse 8 again. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to what? Wrath, that's the tribulation. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the description again in verse 10. Who died for us? That whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with who? With him. All these verses you're going to see are assurance verses for the church. That you can be assured that if you're right now, we're awake, it says, or sleep. We should live together with him. So it doesn't matter what's going on now physically, or if your body was in that grave, you're going to be with him. This is a confidence builder. This is, uh, I guess, what we call, if you want to be triggered by all those bad things, how about getting triggered with some scripture? Look at the scripture. See what the scripture says about you, who you are, who made you who you are. And you're going to find out that the dead man, the old man, is all the things you made. The new man is the creation of God. And the conflict is between that inside person and that outside person. That's going to be a war until this body is going to put on immortality and become uncorrupted. And that hasn't happened yet. So the battle is on. So the Apostle Paul is warning that early church be sober-minded. Be serious-minded about serving the Lord. It's serious business. Why? Because the devil is serious. The devil hates your guts. The devil knows how to use your flesh, that weak part, and use it against you. If you don't put that armor on. If you don't constantly consider your salvation before the Lord. You've got to constantly remember that you're a child of God. You've got to somehow hook up a system in you, and we all do. We're creatures of habit, like I mentioned earlier. You've got to have some kind of system that when you start going haywire, that should be the trigger for you to seek the Lord. When that stuff starts to happen, you don't let it keep happening and then accept it and then go with the flow because you're thinking you're, you're the one that started it and you're involved in all that. You need to Get that flag and say, Micah, wait, whoa, go somewhere. If you can, if you're working assembly line, if you're working something like that, inside, man. Say some prayers. 
get God on the scene. Say, Lord, man, I'm messing up, man. Woo, I'm, I'm getting drawn. Oh, my goodness, help me, Jesus. You know, it's a desperate situation. We're in desperate times. And this is back then when the church was in desperate times. And um, so whether we obey and stay awake or backslide and sleep, we will be with him. And it's not supposed to give us an excuse to say, oh, well, who cares then? Man, you don't ever want to get like that. The sleepers. Well, they expect, when you think about it, they expect uh, peace and safety, according to verse 3, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. They expect all this peace and stuff that... uh, Somehow that's a sign to comfort them in the state that they're in as far as we're talking about the outside influences. And uh, then you, uh, they find sudden destruction instead, travail. They find, and there's no escape to this, uh, thinking about the physical application of what goes on to a backslidden Christian and things that result from that and things that stay with you later on in life that people somehow forget. I think, think about the, the watchers. They know the Lord will come as a thief in the night, according to verse 2. They're prepared for their final uh, salvation, which is the salvation of the body, and uh, they're watchful, watchful and sober. And four of the watchers, they have faith, hope, love, and comfort, according to verses 8 and 11. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, wear a helmet, the hope of salvation, verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, edify one another, even as also you do. James Knox's outline was the word of God works from inside out. Inside out. And we see, um, when we think about them sleepers, They expect peace and safety, and uh, they're not aware of the sudden destruction that's that's coming. Uh, They're sleeping and drinking. (laughs) Verse 6 and 7, sleeping and drinking. Now they're smoking dope. As soon as they made it legal, amen. Everybody going crazy, right? Recreation drugs. And uh, what do they have? They have nothing. And they become just like the children of night. And they hang around in darkness. I uh, heard a sermon preached one, one time, and it might have been Buddy Blunkoff. And it makes so much sense practically with Scripture. When you think about the time when it's at night, and maybe you wake up in the middle of the night and you're going to use the facilities, but it's dark. There's no no light in your room and you're bouncing around a little bit and I've learned to just stand still for a while I stand still for a while and I'll, I'll get darker shadows in the dark and so I'll be able to navigate to the door Lord willing without hitting something metal under the bed or something and uh, you know you get there and you go in there and then when I come back in it's like I shut the door and all of a sudden I stop and I look around I can almost see a little better I don't know if it's because of the little light I got from the facility or what, but I can see a little better. But yet I'm in the darkness. And Buddy says, uh, that's the problem with Christians. You see, they first go into the room of darkness and it scares them. And when they keep staying in that room, their eyes their eyes adapt to the darkness. And then pretty soon they think it's right to be in the darkness. And you think that thing through, you're saying, that's got some spiritual application, don't it, preacher? Yeah. People have always dabbled, because that's flesh, dabbled. And they found out that dabbling turns into an addiction. And the next thing you know, down the line, they say, oh my goodness, what's going to happen to me? Well, you're not going to fare too good at judgment seat of Christ if you're saved. And the other part is, you could die during that thing and go to hell. And that's not good. And the Apostle Paul is trying to draw a line between the children of light and the children of 
darkness so that the people will conclude in themselves that it's very possible for them to live a life of a lost person with the conflict of the spirit living through it with them. And you say, my goodness, I, I can't believe that. Well, you've got to read your Bible. The flesh, the flesh is dead, the Bible says. But then it says, mortify your flesh. What does that mean? You're like a mortician, man. Make it dead. What does that mean? When it says something, say no. You're dead. Leave me alone. And that's easier said than done. But once again, we're creatures of habit. You've got to keep doing that. And what takes place with our republic is we have laws. So that if people cannot control themselves, our laws are supposed to put them in jail. We set up safeguards for this very reason that there's a lot of people that could care less. So you have to, I guess it'd be like whipping a kid when they're younger, right? We're doing something wrong. Make them accountable and fit for the certain crime, for the for the for a certain judgment that they get. I mean, we've got laws to do that. Somebody says you can't legislate morality. Oh, yes, we can. We always do, if you're civilized. So here we have Christians, right, that are dabbling, doing these things, and then they run into a string of what they call, because I believe they're not mature enough, bad luck. But it ain't bad luck. It's God beating the tire out of them, and it's taking a long time for them to understand that. And a lot of times, they're not getting the preaching and the teaching. So the Spirit's not working through the pulpit, the boot camp area. They don't have that. So they're running their life on what they just know to do. And that is everything fleshly. And fleshly enjoys darkness. And that's why when we sit here, you get McGay, you get somebody else up here, they start naming sin or hit sin. Everybody starts a squirming and stuff. And uh, if you want a blessing, there's an app for Lester Roloff. You get nothing but Lester Roloff's music and preaching. You want to squirm? Get that app. You'll be squirming. What do you mean? Because all of a sudden your eyes are going to open up and you're going to say, my goodness, am I in darkness? That ain't good. This ain't good. That ain't right. This ain't right. And you got to understand it's for your benefit. It's like a parent trying to teach their kids to do right. It's for their benefit. Do you understand? Their benefit. And a lot of times people don't care about their benefit. Verse 14, we see that uh, <laughs> a warning, comfort, support, patience. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Whew. What a verse. What are these verses for? Oh, Paul's warning them about that darkness, about slipping back into that, about not serving God. And he's saying some of these things you need to take care of because you're so far away from God, you don't understand you're missing them. You're missing them. I don't know how, how you're doing, but the last part, be patient toward all men. That's a rough one. And then look at verse 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. Man, ain't we the paybackers. <laughs> but look what it says. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. That's saved and lost. Bible says always follow good. And then we see in verse 16, rejoice evermore. So what does that mean, preacher? Well, in, in the Greek, it's rejoice no matter what, I guess. And then how about pray without ceasing? Without ceasing. Hmm. How do you do that? You just do it. You know, I wonder if I'm going to get a job. I wonder if I'm going to make it here. I wonder if I mean, there's enough gas in the car to get me over here. Hey, I wonder if I'm going to do this. I wonder if I'm going to do that. I don't know if you talk to yourself inside yourself. I don't know. It might not be wise like that. The devil's messing around with you too. But I know this, that, you know, you get news. I don't care if it's on social media or whatever. Pray then. Tell people to go and pray then. Don't put it off. If you have one of these little books, you can make a list. 
and you can go over that list. You can put it alphabetical and hit certain letters, certain days. I mean, there's, there's ways to do something. Be why? Because we believe in prayer. We don't just say it. We know the Bible talks about it, encourages us to do it. Paul says without ceasing. And um, as I go down, you can, you, you know, it says judge yourselves, whether it be of the faith or not. I mean, you can go down and say, well, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. My goodness. Because scripture will shine the light on things. And when the light shines and you see, you need to move. Bible says in verse 18, in everything give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Where in the world is the body of Christ? There say people are in the body of who? Christ. We're all part of that spiritual body. And God said, in everything give thanks. Verse 19, quench not the spirit. Man. So we know we got to rejoice no matter what. Praying, thankfulness, never limit God. We see quenching the spirit. Maybe people got to explain to you because your preacher preaches a lot of against emotions if it's contrary to the word of God. But you ha you're an emotional person because God sets you up as an emotional person. That's why you got emotions. Uh, females get more of a grasp of that than men do, and uh, biologically. But uh, you think about these verses. It says, quench not the spirit. Everyone in here, if you're saved, you may not be able to explain everything, but you know when you get off track. Why is that? something inside of you there's no more peace see the Holy Spirit's in you sealed on the day of redemption but all of a sudden the peace goes out the door and a lot of times we'll, people will substitute honest to goodness drugs alcohol whatever to try to you know because they don't understand all this stuff well what they did was they ought to go back to where they lost the peace I don't care which years <laughs> you go you say you know what I was doing fine and then boom and you'd be amazed how we walk without the help of the Spirit because we quenched, we put it out, we put a blanket on it. This helper, this comforter, this teacher. And when you come back to God, you realize that. You say, man, the birds are chirping. We're having a nice day. Man, it's good to be in the house of God, free country. Man, I like it. This is really good stuff. Holy Spirit's peaceful. Everything's peaceful inside. But as soon as we think something bad and then we yield to it, boom, peace goes. You, you think after a while you'll figure that out. Peace goes, something causes the peace to go. Holy Spirit can't leave us, but it can sure not operate like he wants to. Why? Because we quenched him. His action. The Bible says despise not prophecies, prophecies, and we know that when your preacher or you or anyone gets this book and starts telling about things that are going to take place, you're prophesying. You're prophesying according to the word of God. You are not a prophet per se as the Old Testament because everything you say would have to come true. If it didn't, they could stone you and kill you. This book is the sure word of prophecy when we preach it just like right now i'm telling you future you got the peace of god in you right now you know you're saved going to heaven everything's hunky door with uh, with god the peace is there can't can't even be moved out of that position of peace even from heavy preaching you're saying glory to god you'll amen everything from the preacher until he hits your thing and then when he hits your thing guess where the peace goes going and you sit there looking all stuck. <laughs> and you start looking for a verse somewhere. I got a message on loopholes in the Bible. You know, searching for loopholes to somehow ease your conscience instead of saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It affected me. 
I have to get right. You know how long it's been when some of us hit this altar? That tells me about the Holy Ghost being in here heavy. When it leaves, it ought to grieve us. When we grieve the Holy Spirit, it ought to grieve us that we don't have that peace. I mean, wh why do you move during a meeting? Well, because everybody else moves, so I figure I'd move. No. People sit there like this, and everybody else is moving, and they're saved. It's like God comes on there, reveals things to you. You say, you know what? Forget about embarrassment. Forget about this flesh. And, and you come forward, and you, you get altered at the altar. I can't explain it. It works. It just works. And uh, some people can't make it because of health purposes, and that altar's set up, right? Because it's in your heart anyway. Set it up in, your, in, your, in the pew or whatever you do, and you, you get right with God. You're, you're sincere about that. And then that peace comes back. Paul's telling you, in this, this epistle right here, he's warning us. Darkness is dangerous. It's really dangerous for children of light. Because our privilege, our opportunity, has everything to do with light. But as we dabble in darkness, how dark is that darkness? You see, James says, you consume it upon your lust. That means it starts first with us. Lusting for something that you're not supposed to have. You're just not supposed to have it. And we go ahead and do it anyway. That's sin. And then you know what happens after that? There's three. Death. Christian, death of fellowship with God. That peace goes. And then you substitute things that try to somehow make you happy. And a saved person is never really happy unless you're right with God. So the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God is to try and to keep us in a, a constant connection with God, not to lose that connection. And uh, I believe that Paul's trying to do this here. He's, I mean, he gives you the, the future truth of prove all things by his old King James Bible, you see, in verse 21. The Bible says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. How are you going to prove things? By your mind? By education? No, you prove it by the word of God. If it goes through the word of God and it's good, it's good. And I'm sorry, but people are just going to call you a Bible thumper. They're going to say, all you do is talk about Bible. Bible this, Bible that. Ain't you got a mind of your own? Well, I do, but I'd rather have the mind of Christ. Mind of Christ, it works a whole lot better. I'm going to be with him in eternity, you know. This life is just a vapor. I'm just going through. Why should I keep messing up down here? When it robs me of rewards up there. Time's short. We ain't got time for this stuff. Be sober. Stop getting high. If you're on any kind of medications and it makes you wacko, cut it down. Crying out loud. Well, you know, there's wine in the Bible. Man, I'm going to have you talk to George because I can't put up with that no more. Anybody ever tells me that, I says, you just want to get drunk. Well, no. Yeah. Did you find hemp in the Bible yet? Oh, baby, man, it's natural, man. God created it. I mean, yes. <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, go out and throw you a joint of poison ivy then, stupid. I mean, you know, maybe you get a rush off of that, too, and itch, too. I mean, it's just stupid what people do. And a lot of this is saved people. Trying to hang on to the stuff of the flesh that they got desires and urges and release and all these things that sin because it's the old man. Only peace you get is in Christ. Greatest message you'll ever get is from this book. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You to grow in faith. Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. We keep pushing everything, I'm telling you. I said we. I am, I've been doing the we thing, so calm down. And then look at verse 22. Oh, boy. Abstain from some appearance of evil. 
I'm telling you, man. you got to really be thinking for this one. You really do. Because innocently, most of us in America, my goodness, you know what we say? Well, to each his own. I can't help what they're thinking. Yes, you can. If I'm if I go to a beer and wine store and I and I you know how pop is now with the brown bottles, some of it good pop too. But anyway, if I had that bottle in a paper bag and had it like this, and I came out at like this, we got a very little church. But I guarantee you everybody in the neighborhood knows preachers are drunk. And I know I'm right. I didn't drink, but it was the appearance. It just looked like it. I mean, Americans, Laodicea, man, we just, you know, you go on, you know, office things. I remember being at Hercules, and, you know, everybody gets the glasses, and they're, we had this meeting, and, and um, they're getting scotch and bourbon and everything. And this gal comes over here and brings me a nice little glass of Coca-Cola, right? Got this thing come out like an umbrella and junk. I said, what's that? Well, I didn't want you to fill out a, like, I said, I don't drink. Somebody comes to this table, they're going to look. Walk by. How about all the guys I work with? Are they all going to know it's just Coca-Cola? Preacher, that's so insignificant. I know. That's why the verse says, abstain from all appearance of evil. you got to know what evil is. You get that from the book. thought I'd enlighten you a little bit there. Amen. Why? Because hey, these verses get me. I'm sharing well. Look at verse 23. Verse 23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. What does that mean? Mentally, physically, and spiritually. Our God's triune. We believe in a triune God, a trinity. Three different essences. He created man in his image. Right? Man's spirit died when he sinned. You're born again, guess what? Your spirit's made alive. So the Apostle Paul's saying, hey, bud, listen to this one. He says, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That means complete. The God of what? Peace. So you're walking around as a Christian, you got no peace? Well, who took your peace? Was it sin that took your peace? Was it the devil that messed with your head and got you confused about your stability in the Lord? What was it? Why don't you have peace? That's up to you to find out. Why live not having the peace of God? That's peace mentally, spiritually, and physically. That's why a lot of times you can go to saints' um, hospital beds excruciating pain, you know, end of cancer and everything, just eating them up. How in the world can they bless you? How in the world can they give you peace? And they're smiling, ready to go to heaven. Their physical condition's a mess. You know that pain and everything works on your mental condition. It's because of that spirit is overwhelming in them. And the peace of God controls all things. It's a blessing. He says, holy. And then Paul says, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're seeing blameless. Now the new person, I'm blameless. But because of the rewards up in heaven and the connection between that and my walk in this flesh, there's great possibility I can ruin my Christian testimony, ruin that position I have on my journey down here with the Lord, and even cause him to take me home early. Because sin does produce death. Separation, fellowship, also literal death. It can cause. I mean, Over the years, I've, I've talked to people that got lung cancer and, you know, I didn't want to put the knife in them and, you know, 
make them feel even worse. But I just said, did you smoke? They said, oh, yeah, for years and years and years, you know, 30, 40 years. And you have lung cancer. And they look at me and say, I get it, preacher. God didn't do it. We did it to ourselves. I mean, I don't know how many you are, only a few people that I know ever picked up a cigarette the first time and, and didn't cough. I mean, you know, I have heard of people, they got hooked immediately just as if it was crack, but it ain't, it's tobacco. Me, I can still remember stealing palm oils from my mouth. Big long things. Because everybody was smoking. I mean, that I hung around with. Uh, anyway. So I remember going in the bathroom, and everybody's like this. They're doing like this, and they, some of them have learned how to stand, how to do it out their nose. There was even a couple of them that could put the little, you know. And you're amazed, man. You're saying, wow, this is really cool. And they say, well, you smoke, don't you? Yeah. You know, light it up, and the hacking started. I thought I was going to die. I got so sick, and everybody's laughing and cracking up. And uh, this is what they said to me. You're not going to we didn't tell you to inhale it. They kept it in their mouth and did all this stuff. Yeah, the joke was on me. Big time. Then what happened? Well, everybody started inhaling. I kept doing it. You know what happened? I liked it. It was easy. And you know, I'm 70 years old. I know you, didn't, you can't tell, but I'm, I'm 70. Different body parts than you. And, um, you know... I'm saying to myself, me and Kenny's watching, I, I, I like watching them old black and white. The new kids, the grandkids, you know, they don't like anything black and white. So you're st stupid, man. Sit down here and watch this anyway. You know, they're cool. Back in those days, it was cool. But every one of them old timey movies, man, they love to smoke. Women love to smoke. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying, God says, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. My new man is blameless. That old man's not. And then look at verse 24. If you can explain this, knock yourself out. It says, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. For ministers, there's another verse that God count me faithful, put me into the ministry. I never claim that as a trophy because I cannot believe that he considers me faithful. I, I, I don't understand. But see, his ways are above our ways. Man, so far of understanding, you can't figure it out. God's good to us. I'm talking about sleeping. And I'm talking about watchers. He didn't just say awoke. He said watchers. And, 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 and I go through these verses, and I see verse 24, then 25. Look what he says. After all this warning and everything, because Paul ought to know, right? I mean, he's instructing us in how to live, to be sober. And so he's talking to people that, that are maybe doing wrong. That's why he's giving the warning. And you come down here, and he says, brethren, pray for us. He understands the dual nature, Romans chapter 7, like we all should. And he's warned us about the flesh. And if you're used to darkness, you've got to get out of it. You've got to ask for some help. Because usually if you're in darkness, you develop bad habits. And those habits, you will defend bad habits, you will defend bad thoughts, you will defend everything. Why? Because it's like this flesh hanging on to everything, and you don't want to give nothing else. You don't want to die to Christ. Dying to Christ means you've got to give stuff up to serve God if the stuff is wrong. And I'm just saying, if you stay in the darkness, you're going to develop some very bad habits. And verse 26 says, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. And, you know, holy kiss is not a sensual, sexy, slobbering, queer thing. Amen, just so you know that. Queer thing. The definition of queer, you know, to normal. Yeah. Verse 27. I'm telling you. Look what it says. I charge you by 
the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. This is a charge to all preachers to preach this. Hmm. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. The effectiveness of the word of God is dependent upon the heart condition of the hearer, according to 1 Thessalonians 2.13. The scriptures are true, and God inspired them and preserved them and used human instruments. We know that. If you hear the word of God and you believe it as it is the very word of God, it effectually works in your life. If you hear preaching and you're diagnosing and you're getting skeptical and you're running your mind all over the place, you miss the message. God ordained the church. God ordained this kind of ministry. He did this. Not we ourselves. So there is a condition that has to be present for you to receive the word of God in a way that it affects you and you grow. And that is by listening, believing the very words of God. This ain't no coincidence. This is the real stuff. This is what's been going on ever since. Acts. Preaching and teaching the word of God. And people growing in the Lord. And because of our peace that we've got in this country. That no other country had like this. We have taken advantage and dropped our guard. And now God has given us a president. Vice president. My goodness, people. For us not to take this serious, maybe he's going to give us enough time to repent, to see his goodness, maybe move in revival. Wouldn't that be something for the rapture? Because there's too great a waste. Maybe there'll be a third. Maybe. What did you preach? Well, Preach, preach against sin. Live a holy life. That's the closest you can get to God right now in your state. And try to progress by the help of God. Learn more. Because I could just ask you a few questions right now. Do you read your Bible every day? I didn't say how much. I'm just letting you think about that. When you get up in the morning, you thank the Lord, you praise the Lord, that you're breathing, that your legs are... I'm busy, kid. I mean, I'm telling you, people on that map, my goodness, appreciate life. Appreciate their saved life. They praise the Lord because their lives are at stake serving God. Here, mental battles. The devil works on neutralizing us. He does that by getting us in the dark a little good thing at a time so you get into the dark and it's abused and that's where you're going to camp for a while but you won't have the peace of God you will not have the peace of God you'll kind yourself with a positive thought but you ain't got the peace of God in here the peace of God is supposed to rule in our hearts ain't got it go somewhere, get ready with God because you sure ain't getting here yet. And uh, thank God for everything that he